It's wonderful to see all of you here today. Tell you what, it's a joy to be able to preach to people instead of a camera lens. That's a blessing. Man, if you've never done it before, don't try it. It's not fun. Uh, so if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up God's holy word with us this morning to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. And I want to tell you, I'm preaching to our graduates today, so I can't see all of you kind of dispersed out there in different places, but I'm preaching to you guys. So the rest of us are just kind of listen, going to listen in as we hear God's word for our graduates this morning. However, everything that I'm going to say this morning applies to all of us. It applies to all of us. And so these principles that we're going to study in God's word about a successful life really apply to everyone. They're going to apply to you just as much as our graduates. But I am going to preach directly to them, and I want you to listen to the, to God's word this morning. You know, seven of the 19 times the word sekel, which means success, is translated success, is found in the Old Testament 19 times. Seven of those are, fa are, are in Proverbs. So Solomon, as he writes his wisdom to his son, he wants his son to be successful. He's concerned about his son having success. And I want to tell you this morning that God wants all of us to be successful. He wants us to have a successful life. But probably not in the way that you're thinking about success. If you're defining success by the world's standards of success, health, wealth, and prosperity, material prosperity, then you've got it wrong. God defines success differently. True success comes from loving and living for Jesus Christ. That's what true success is about, graduates. If you want to be successful in your life, it means living for and loving Jesus Christ above anything else. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It's not on the screen. I'm just going to quote it. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. True success is loving and living Jesus, living for Jesus Christ. Won't you stand with me if you found that place in your Bible? Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to read down through verse 12, okay? So hang in there with us. Let's read together. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success. There's that word. In the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. And turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that we have the wonderful privilege of gathering together, reading your scripture and resting under the authority of your word. Today, Lord, we submit our hearts willingly to your work within us. Father, would you mold us and shape us into the image of Jesus Christ this morning? Lord, that you would free our minds of any thought or distraction that is contending for your attention today. 
that we might focus wholeheartedly with the fullness of our minds upon Jesus Christ. And it is in His name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. So, Proverbs begins in this way, as Solomon writes. He says in Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, I would encourage you graduates to commit that to memory. Proverbs 1, 7. Write that down and remember it always. Remember that because that guides our lives. It puts life into perspective. It helps us understand that no matter what we learn, the main thing that we need to know is the Lord. Now, I'm going to give you five steps to spiritual success. Five steps to success. You like that? Five steps? That's easy, right? Quick and easy. Five steps. Now, here's the thing. These aren't magical steps. This is God's Word, and this is God's admonition to us. Solomon gives his son about, f- about five of these imperatives, and each one of these imperatives is paired with a promise. In, in other words, so if you will do this, then this will happen. I like that. Cause and results, right? I like that. I love that because it, it, it helps me see it clearly in my mind. And so here's the first one. Number one, keep God's commands. Keep God's commands. Do what God says. Notice in verse 1 again, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands. Keep my commandments. And so the command there is to keep God's commands, all of God's commands. And God's commands come from three sources. His Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide you. He will be in you. If you know Christ, He will tell you what to do. He will be that voice that says, don't turn to the right or to the left, but keep straight on the path. He's the voice. But then also His Holy Word. God's Word speaks clearly each and every day. And if you want to know what God has to say for your life, get into His Word. And then also, God's holy people. I love the, the admonition, the encouragement that Stephen gave to you guys. And that is to find godly people to be around. Find that support group to be around. If you are able to stay in Pensacola, come to Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, even after you've graduated, even after you go to college, if you're able to stay around. If you're not able to stay here, in our community, find a church, find a group of people to fellowship with because the Word of God is proclaimed among His people. The Word of God is kept among His people, and you will be held accountable by God's people, and you will find the support that you need to be able to have success around God's people. So he says these words, and let me just look at this. You look at this with me one more time. It says, do not forget my teaching. We have a tendency, most of us have a tendency to think a good thought and then later on forget everything that we thought. Do you have that problem? I have that problem. That's why I have to write things down if I want to remember them. So I have a little note app on my phone, and if I really want to remember something, God gives me a thought during the week, guess what I do? I write it in my phone app, and I remember that throughout my week. And I I want to encourage you to do that. If you want to take a note tab or you want to sit down and write things down, write those things down that God puts on your heart. Journal over the years. Do those things so that you will remember and not forget. Now, he says, do not forget, and what he encouraged Israel to do And what Solomon is encouraging his son to do is to memorize. I know. I know you're thinking, Brother Josh, you're telling me to memorize something else. And I would say, yeah, it's the most important thing to memorize. What is it? God's word to memorize it, commit it to memory, put it in your heart. Because here's the thing, when we put God's word in our heart, When we put God's Word in our heart, it comes out when we're squeezed by the devil. When we're squeezed by a difficult situation. 
when we're put in a, in a moment that tries us, God's Word comes out. And here's the thing. If you'll get in God's Word, God's Word will get into you. And that's what will come out whenever you're in a difficult situation. So he says, don't forget it. But he says, let, my, let your heart keep my commands. So he's talking about his own commands, but Solomon is the personification of wisdom. And Paul tells us that all of the wisdom of God is in Christ Jesus. And so this is the will of Christ Jesus, the law of Christ Jesus that is written on our hearts. He says, let your heart keep it. And here's the thing, when we try to modify our behavior, we try to modify our behavior without modifying belief, we end up burdened and bitter. But when we allow God's word to shape us and tra- change us and transform us, we will find out that our behavior begins to change. And it'll be a lot easier to do the things of God and to keep his commands. So listen, I'm not trying to impose upon you guys a set of rules. I want you to get that. What I am trying to tell you to do is to spend time with the Lord, spend time in his word, put it in your heart. And God will make you the kind of person he wants you to be. And so, keep God's commands. And he, notice actually what he says. He says, for length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. And many people think that, that the word of God, the commands of God are burdensome. But notice what Solomon says. He says, if you get into God's word and God's word gets into you, then this is what will happen. You will have length of days and years of life. I've seen that at work in the lives of the people around me. Whenever they kept God's word, God gave them a happy, full life. But let me just give you just a brief example of what Solomon is talking about. God says, do not steal. That's what he says, and that's clear. A person who steals is a what? He's a sinner, but what is he? What do we call him? He's a thief. Thieves are going to get in trouble and go to jail, right? So this is not true that you would find favor and good success, right? You're going to go to jail. That's not favor. That's not good success. That's a mark on your record for the rest of your life because you stole. That is a practical example of what God says. And then you take every single command of Scripture and you apply them to your life. If you break God's command, there will be consequences for that action. And so he says, keep his commands. Now that's hard, I believe, to a degree, because none of us are going to be perfect about that. But David says this in Psalm 119.9, how can a young man keep his commands? way pure by guarding it well what is the guard that we're supposed to put up the station at the door of our heart he says this is it listen by guarding it according to your word the more you get into god's word the more you memorize god's word the more successful you will be so keep god's commands and then secondly clothe yourself with kindness Clothe yourself with kindness. Notice actually what he says. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. The word steadfast love there is this beautiful picture. It is the Hebrew word chesed. And what that word literally means is God's loving kindness. It's translated loving kindness or steadfast love in multiple places. And the psalmist says, the chesed of the Lord never ceases. This is his character. This is God's character. Some of you, when you graduate and and you graduate from college, you move on, you're going to be wearing different types of clothes than you're wearing right now. Now, don't get me wrong. You're all dressed nice. You look great, okay? But you're going to wear some different clothes. Some of you will wear a uniform as you protect us from evil. Some of you will wear a suit in an office as you crunch the numbers. Some of you will wear scrubs in a hospital or a clinic. Some of you will wear coveralls as you keep America running smoothly. I remember whenever I was younger pretending to be my dad and putting on his coat and thinking in that moment that I was grown. I remember, you know, doing that. 
like some of you probably have. The Bible tells us to clothe ourselves with kindness, to clothe ourselves with this steadfast love. He says, bind them around your neck. It's like putting a necklace on or, or a scarf on. And he says, write them on the tablet of your heart. Wear it like a garment. So he's saying to put this on us and in us. What is it? God's kindness, God's love. Put that on you. Write them on your heart. If you spend your life burning bridges, using people up and throwing them away, you'll wake up one day and realize that you have everything you want and no one to share it with. The world says, love things, serve yourself, and use people in the process. God says, God's word says, love him, serve people, and use things in the process. And it's all about priorities. So he says, let steadfast love and faithfulness not forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of man. Then here's the third point. Going quickly, because I have five. I said I had five. So here's three. Learn to lean. Learn to lean. So listen to verse five. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. The Hebrew word here that we're listening to, it says uh, in the promise there that it's going to bring healing and flesh and refreshment to your bones whenever you do these things. That word is the word rapha, and we get the Greek word therapy from that word. In other words, it's going to be therapeutic to you whenever you do this. Whenever you don't lean on your own understanding, but you lean on him. So I want to illustrate this for a second. A couple of guys that I had come up here. Go ahead and grab my illustration. Bring it right over here, because this is where our graduates are sitting. So whenever I decide I want to trust in my own understanding, and by the way, that English word understanding is made out of two words, the word under and the word standing. What that looks like is if I want to lean on my own understanding, it's like putting all of my accomplishments, all of my wisdom, all of my achievements, piling them up and then standing upon them and then anchoring my life to it. And then trying to lean on it. If I were to try to lean on this rope. That's attached to everything that represents my understanding. Is it going to hold me? No. I'm going to fall off and crack my head. Which would be a bad, bad idea. All right. But it's a rope. You know, it's, a, it's, it's something you know, that some people do lean on. So here's a thought. Well, let's say. Instead of trusting in my own understanding and leaning on it, I decide I'm going to put my life in the hands of other people and I'm going to lean on them. Now, we encourage you to find that support group because, look, all right, Cameron can, can, Cameron can lean on me. You can pull back just a little bit, brother. I'm not going to let you go. All right, and then I can lean on Cameron, all right, like this. And when we find that friend, that faithful friend in the Lord, we can lean on them, right? And that's good. The Bible says if we find a friend, we found a good thing. Find companions, we're finding good things in life. But what if, what if your friend lets go? I mean, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? I mean, have any of you ever been let down by people in your life? Yeah. Yeah. They do let you down. So what if you're not really anchored in the right place? The Bible is teaching us, Solomon is teaching us to make sure that we have the right anchor point in our life. That we anchor our life to the one thing that will never, ever let us down. So guys, would you pick it up for me? Some of us today... In this room, not just the graduates, I'm talking to everybody right now. We need to elevate our anchor point. We've, we've been let down with, by people and we're hurt. 
We've been leaning on our own understanding for far too long, and we've let ourselves down, and we're miserable. And we've got to elevate the anchor point just a little bit. So I've got this point here, and let's say we could attach it all the way up there to the ceiling. I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to put a hole in the ceiling. But I got a couple of strong guys right here, right? You been working out, Stephen? Oh, okay. What do you look like you have? Uh, gyms are closed. Gyms are closed. You been working out, brother? All right, so, so look, now because I've anchored my rope, my life, to the right anchor point, I've elevated my anchor point, guess what now? I can lean. I can lean. Thank you, guys. Give him a hand for a second for helping me. No, you can take it. Thank you. Don't trip on the rope. So let me encourage you, graduates and those who are listening in, to lean on the Lord, to elevate that anchor point, to trust in Him and lean on Him heard a story about a famous Christian evangelist who was confronted by a young college student who challenged his stance for Christ, and he said, Christianity is a crutch. It's a crutch for the weak, and they're just leaning on their faith. And this evangelist countered that, and he said, Listen, if both of my legs were broken, I would appreciate a wheelchair. I would need the wheelchair, and I would gladly lean on the wheelchair. He said, if even one of my legs were broken, I would appreciate a pair of crutches, and I would gladly lean on that pair of crutches. And he said, what you're missing is that I am a broken man, and I need to lean on Jesus Christ. And he said, so are you. You're broken. And you just don't realize it. So if Christianity is a crutch, it's because we're all broken people. And we need it. We lean because we cannot stand on our own. You cannot stand on your own. And so keep God's commandments. Clothe yourself with kindness. Learn to lean. Third, uh, fourthly, give generously. Now notice what he says. And I didn't say this. God said it. So listen, verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. What a promise. So the command is to honor the Lord with your wealth and the world will tell you to take what you can get, keep all you can take and use it for your own pleasure. But God says to honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits. That means do it first. Make it the priority. I am absolutely unashamed to tell you that you should tithe. You should take a tenth of what God gives you and designate that as the baseline of your giving. And do that first. But then on top of that, if the Lord ever puts it on your heart to give, you give generously. You do it without reservation. Why? Why? Because there's a promise built into that. That's that's one big reason. There's a huge promise that's built in. Malachi 3 and verse 10 says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you. Listen to this. How much? Pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. You see, God has figured this out about a generous person. God knows it. God doesn't have to figure anything out, but he knows this about you. He knows that he can trust a generous person with more. He knows that if you're willing to give, he can trust you with more. Because let's face it, folks, we all, we all have more than we need. Can you say that? Amen? We have more than we need. So what about what's left over? You have that portion that you need for yourself, and God has promised He will take care of that need, and He will fill that up. But then what about the excess? 
It's all meant for someone else. Do you get that? It's all meant for someone else. It's not meant for you to accumulate more. It's meant for someone else, for you to use it. Does that mean we don't save? No, absolutely not. We do save for the future because we will have future needs, and others in our lives will have future needs. So savings is, is according to God's word. God tells us to save. But everything that's excess that we don't need should be designated for someone else. So we might be a blessing for them. And so God says give generously. And when you make God's kingdom your priority, it will allow you to give joyfully and freely. So lastly, and everyone said, whew, good, I'm glad we're at point five now. Point five. All right, verse 11, listen to what he says. My son... Do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Reproof. You know what that means? It means chastisement. It means correction. It means telling you what you did wrong. How many of you like that conversation? How many of you like to have that conversation with someone else? No. But let me ask you, though, when you have had to have that conversation with someone and tell them what they did wrong, you are overwhelmed. Let me just let you testify. You've been overwhelmed with a sense of duty and love for that person. And that motivated you to say what they did wrong. Amen? Okay. So we know that that's what God does for us. He loves us enough to... Reprove us. And we need to receive it. Now, this word is found in the New Testament in a couple of places. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And some of us, the reason we're avoiding God's Word right now today, we haven't been in the Word of God, is because we don't like the way that it makes us feel about our sin and what we've been doing wrong that God wants to correct within us. And so we've avoided the Word of God. We, avo we avoid spiritual conversations. We will come to church because we can sit in a pew and remain anonymous. But whenever it comes to getting, in, getting into God's Word, we avoid that situation or having that conversation because we don't want to be reproved. We don't like it because it's uncomfortable. But the writer of Hebrews tells us in, verse, in chapter 12, he says, In your struggle against sin, you've not resisted the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. What is discipline? That's training. That's making you the person that God wants you to be. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated then you are illegitimate children and not sons. In other words, he says, if your conscience is never provoked by your sin and you never experience the reproof of God, you should be very, very worried. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says you're illegitimate. In other words, you might not really be a Christian. So he says, check that. And then he says... Fathers disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. How many of you can say amen to that? When you ever got spanked, were you like, ooh, that was good, hit me again? Do you feel that way? No. All discipline for the moment seems painful. It's unpleasant. But in the end, he says... Okay, But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. God is still working on you. He's still working on all of us. 
This is a great milestone of achievement in the life of our graduates, but God is still working on you. He's still making you the person He wants you to be. And I want you to go ahead and mark it down, all of you. Not just our graduates, mark this down. Because if you live long enough, this is what's going to happen. I want you to remember, graduates, I want you to remember something. If you don't remember anything else I've said, remember what I'm about to say right now. You will make mistakes. You will make mistakes. And not just little mistakes like you wash your whites with your reds the first time you do a load of laundry. Hopefully some of you know how to do that already. But I'm talking about big, life-altering mistakes. In those moments, you will feel defeated and deflated. And you will want to lay down and let the rest of the world continue on without you in that moment. But you'll hear the voice of God saying this. This is not my plan for you. And in that moment, I pray that God helps you remember Proverbs chapter 3. And you remember verse 11 where it says, My son, my daughter, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of His reproof. Why? For the Lord reproves him whom He loves as the Father, the Son, in whom He delights. So in that moment, God is saying to you, get up, dust yourself back off, because you're my child. I love you. And I delight in you. And I pray that those words will guide you for the rest of your life. And you will have those straight paths. And when you do turn off the path, you can hear God's voice saying, come back. And some of you today, you're taking this opportunity right now today, and God has put it on your heart. And He's saying, yeah, you have strayed away. You've gone off the path. Or you need to get back into the Word and in prayer, spending time with the Lord. And you're feeling right now, as we've studied God's Word, the reproof of God. Let me encourage you that God says He reproves the one He loves And He delights in you. And He's not willing to let you slip away. And that's why you've heard this message today. It's because the Lord loves you. And He's not willing to let you go. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you felt the tug of the Lord on your heart this morning as we've studied God's Word together, and you've, you've known for some time now, even before you came to this place, that God is calling you back to Himself. Don't turn away from that. Don't pull away from that tug. That's God pulling on your heart, reminding you that you belong to Him. If you're here with us this morning and You've never given in to that tug. Let me tell you what that's about. The Lord Jesus Christ, He he died on the cross for your sin because you had broken the law of God. But Jesus paid the penalty. And then three days later, He was raised again. And now He's offering you eternal life. And all that it takes is for you to say yes to Jesus. Yes, Lord, I belong to you. I'm giving my life to you because you died for me. If you've never done that before, this is your opportunity to make that commitment.
commitment and trust him with all your heart. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to lead you in a prayer. If you want to give your heart to Jesus, pray this prayer. Lord, I admit to you that I am a sinner. I know that I've made mistakes. And I'm guilty. But Lord, I believe that Jesus came. He lived that perfect life that I could never live. He was sinless. And then he died for me. I believe that on the third day, he was raised again to prove that he is God. And so, Lord, now I confess my faith in Jesus. And I commit my life to him. I want to live the rest of my life loving and living for Jesus. Thank you, God, for the gift of new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with us? If you prayed that prayer this morning, we want to offer you the opportunity to make that known. I want to pray with you. I want to congratulate you and encourage you. It's the best decision that you've ever made to trust Jesus. If you're coming back to the Lord this morning because you've been away from Him from some time and you want to recommit, maybe this new stage of your life, God is saying, this is about me. And He wants you to make it about Him for the rest of your life from here forward. You come. Let's pray together. Let me pray and encourage you. You can come before the Lord and just kneel before Him and pray. Whatever it is that God has put on your heart, you be faithful and obey this morning. Let us sing together. Amen.